Whoops. Which, which uh, to put that in context, that's probably, for to you guys, it sounds like a lot of money. You probably earn a lot more money sitting at a desk nine to five, but for us, we get all of this lovely lifestyle of living in Gisborne, so we, we're quite happy to earn maybe slightly less over the course of a year, but we get to go to the kids' school assemblies and we get to go surfing at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday, and so it all kind of, it's that sort of, there's more, more than how much you earn, you know what I mean? Like, this, this company affords us a really lovely lifestyle. Should we move on? Um, some of the people that we work with, and I presented this morning, and I said to them when I was writing this up last night, this presentation last night, it's, it's when, you, when you're involved in a small business, you're quite often just head down and buried in the work that you're doing. You don't often get a chance to stand back and look at what you're doing. I wrote this up last night, and I got this little rush of pride. I was like, man, that's awesome for a little two-person company in Gisborne. We've worked with all these massive organisations, and um, they all love us, and they come back to us for more work, and um, I've got to say I'm pretty, pretty proud of that list. It's taken us a lot of years to get there, but um, yeah, it's cool. Um, so getting back to that thing I talked about before, and I'm going to be really quick on this because I do think it's quite, not quite the target audience, but content strategy, in a nutshell, that's sitting down with someone like Rushman Rose or someone like Bluebridge or someone like the Sorted team and saying, working with them to find out who we're targeting with the site, which is really important because that determines how we talk to people, how we write, the style, the tone, the, the words that we use. For example, with Bluebridge, we decided that a lot of their clients or um, potential customers would be for, uh, people from other countries, so we need to go really plain English, really simple language that someone from Germany is going to get with even a passing um, handle on English. Um, we might be targeting people like you guys, which means we probably talk in a way which is a lot more informal, a lot more loose maybe. Uh, there might be some tech speak even in there. God forbid, I'm an English lover. Um, or, or we might be writing uh, as, as something on the sorted site which is targeted at pensioners, in which case it might be slightly more formal. We might be saying uh, you know, some, a, a slightly more formal tone. So it's our job to kind of work out how we write in a way that people are going to respond well to. And it's always different because every site is targeted at someone else. Um, we work out their priorities. So what are they most likely want, going to want? In the case of Bluebridge, we, we decided they're just going to want to know how much and when the ferry sailing. Okay, so that's the number one priority. So that needed to come right up on the home page. We work out how we're going to create it. Is it going to be somebody sitting in the business or are they going to contract someone like right-click in to do it? And then we're going to work out how to keep it fresh and relevant because the key with websites and apps and all that stuff these days, everything online, it needs to be absolutely current, fresh and alive and constantly changing and updating. So, and that's a process that we need to help those people learn. In the old days, there was no such thing as content strategy. Websites were designed very much from a design-driven perspective. So designers were given this big budget and sorry to any designers in the room. And they'd make these things that were flashy and whizzy and, and you know, but, you know, try and find the, the opening hours and you'd be on there for 15 minutes while you're negotiating through all this flashery and, 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 and there was no structure to stuff. So that's how things used to be on websites. With content strategy, they look like this. So everything has a place, everything has an orderly way, and it means that for you when you get onto a website to find out when, who's playing at Rhythm and Vines or you get on there and you want to find out what the weather's going to be like tomorrow, it's a completely intuitive process. And when you're on a good website that does it well, you don't even know that you're doing it. You just know where to go, click, 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 two clicks, and you're exactly where you want to be. It didn't used to always be like that. Um, out of content strategy comes information architecture, and it sounds really verbose and technical, but it's not. It's just a simple case of finding a logical structure for information, okay? So it's, it's sorting information. It's sort of where we overlap with a librarian in a way, so we actually give an order and a, and a process to where content sits on a site. So devising a logical structure, putting the user at the centre of the process, and I'm banging on about this a lot, but it's a huge part of what we do, okay? We, it's our job to say who's using it, why, how, what do they want? And information architecture is a big part of that. And labels, so that's the words that we use on the sites which act as signposts. So those, those words across the top banner, so they help you navigate that site really quickly and it's a big thing. And when we've done information architecture well, we wind up with something like this. We didn't do this, I grabbed this off Google. But it's a really simple idea and you wind up with a thing called a site map and it looks something like that or it might look like something else but you get the idea. It gives the structure before the, before the design even starts. Okay, So the designers haven't even been involved at this point. This is stuff which gives a map for the design process. Something else which is related to content strategy is a thing called a content plan and this is a big part of what we do again. This is, in this case, we did this for ACC, and you'll see that it's an Excel spreadsheet. And I hope none of you have ever had to use one because they are a nightmare. It's my least favorite part of the job. May you never have to use Excel. 
Every page on the site has a line and it determines what's going to be on the page, which images are required, who's going to write it, when it's going to be updated, and that content plan, if it's done well, will be retained and updated through the, through the, through the website development process. And we are often called upon to develop that content plan. Any questions? Pretty boring part of the presentation, I've got to say. Yeah? Pardon? Can you sort out a study link for us? What does that mean, mate? Like, um, That's the study link. Oh, is it no good? No. I'll make a note. So, so you find it hard to find stuff? Well, they deliver it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll make a mental note. I'll, I'll, we're always looking for, for um, people to go and shoulder tap, so thanks for the tip. And I thank God we didn't work on that site. Because <laughs> we could well have. Um, so, and then we've got the strategy, we've got the content plan, we've got all the, we've got all the maps and all the, t the, the kind of vaguely techy stuff done, and then it's time to write, and as I've, al I've already kind of mentioned, when we're writing, we're often caught, or always called upon to write for a brand, and that's about determining the right style and tone, the kind of language we use, the kind of words that are in or out, um, the, sort, the sort of vibe that we want to create with the writing. Um, and it's a part that I really love. Plain English, and that is a simple case of avoiding jargon, and I hope I've done a fairly good job of doing that today. It's, it's writing, especially important for people like StudyLink, government sites who seem to have this complete inability to uh, understand what users, what people like you and I are going to like and, and understand. So uh, we often are um, demystifying a lot of jargon that is given to us by government clients. And they think it makes perfect sense because they're immersed in it every day. They've got desks full of paper which talk in these terms. They go to meetings and everyone talks in this way. They have no concept that people in the, out in the world have no idea what it, what it means. So our job is to turn that into language which is really quick and easy to understand. Search engine optimization. Anyone got a clue what that means? Sounds pretty techy, but again, it's not. It's just words. Search, optimi uh, in s search engine optimization, or SEO, is a process which gets somebody's website on the first page, ideally, that's the goal, of Google results. So if you put into Google something, who's searched something in Google recently? What do you look for on Google? Uh, stuff. <laughs> stuff. Good luck with that search. <laughs> Any, anything a little bit more specific? Yep. Okay, YouTube, all right? You want to find and something specific. You want to find the, 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 the gnarliest playground rumble on something on YouTube, right? That's the stuff you guys watch, eh? Yeah? Eh? Minecraft. But, okay, is it a game? Okay, all right. So you put that into Google, and with the first page of results come up, and um, statistically, we know that very few people go on beyond the first page for Google. If it's not on the first page, you give up, or you go for the first 10. Everybody wants to be on the first page. We help them get there by putting the words in the right place because Google sends out these things called spiders and they kind of read websites, okay? So where words are, where they are featured in the page, how we get a good Google ranking, which is really important to a lot of companies and government. That's about what we do. Any questions at that point? Okay, a little bit about us, um, how we started, how we got to where we are. I'm going really fast. I'll take a breather. Um, Right click's beginning. So both my partner and I worked in corporate communication. We both started in journalism, okay, so we both kind of knew how to write. And then we, we got involved in corporate communications, and that involved sitting in an office on the 15th floor in Wellington, 9 to 5 or 8 to 6, writing press releases, uh, meeting with uh, journalists. I hated it. Drove me absolutely nuts. I was never made to sit in an office, and I learned that really early on. While I was sitting in that office in my job, I realized that we were starting to outsource a lot of work for writing specifically for the web because it's different to writing for print. And kind of hatched the idea that, hey, we're trying to get all these people who can write for web. Why don't we become those people? And then we don't have to sit in the office. And then we can visit the office like these people that we have to deal with every day. I want to be that person. So we took a punt. And in 2005, we started RightClick. And within a couple of months, we, we did a couple of little jobs. We did a couple of free jobs. Um, and then we, we landed our first proper project which was for the National Library and it was a doozy, it was massive and it kept us busy for probably six months and at the, bear in mind at the same time we'd never run a company before, we'd, you know, we were completely out of our depth, bluffing our way through, pretending we understood what people were talking about in meetings and somehow pulled it off and what we learnt was uh, is that one good job becomes two good jobs, becomes three good jobs and so we quickly adopted the business plan which was portfolio is everything. So we just focused on getting as good a job as we could because we found that if you got a good job, put it on your website, someone would see that and go, we want them to do the same for us. 
And that has effectively been our business plan ever since. We target really good clients, really good jobs, and one job begets another one, effectively. So there's our, that's where we started in Wellington, somewhere around about kind of in here. Um, had a great time in Wally, loved it. Then we got forced out of Wellington because the housing market went balmy. We moved over the hill to the Wider Upper. Anyone been to the Wider Upper? Carterton, Masterton, Featherston. Um, really cheap houses. Had some friends over there. Fantastic surf. I love surfing. And it was a one hour commute to Wellington a couple of times a week to meet clients. So it was a pretty good model. We had a little baby and it was lovely jubbly. That's the Wider Upper coastline, which I know and love. Quite different from Gizzy, eh? Fewer, fewer trees, less sunshine. And then we decided to get more remote. I had a son living in Gisborne who um, was from a previous relationship. We had a new little daughter. We thought, let's get them together. And in 2008, with all this confidence of a few good years, we moved to Gisborne right on time for the global credit crunch. And in the space of about six weeks, we lost pretty much all of our work, all of our clients. I picked grapes for a month. And then we um, decided, while I was picking grapes, I said, this company we've started is just too damn good. I'm not going to let it die. And we got busy and dug it out of that hole. There's the beautiful family. So do you keep on traveling around New Zealand? Absolutely. You're onto it. So I'm going to get to that, but you're, you're very intuitive there. We also moved for other reasons. It wasn't just family and lifestyle. It was the main reason, but there were other ones. There was, for example, this reason. And that reason. And also this reason. This place is paradise for a surfer, right? It's as simple as that. So since moving to Gisborne, the global financial crisis and recession, lots of flights. What's your name? Jenna. Jenna, you're onto it. So the way that we dug ourselves out, we accepted that while we are, we are reliant on this wonderful thing called the internet, which allows us to work for, on two laptops and two phones and work in Wellington while we're sitting out at, at, at the kitchen table in, in Gisborne, we also realise the importance of relationships. And in this age of online everything, we still believe in the absolute critical importance of sitting down with people and meeting them, shaking their hands and having a coffee. And there's just no beating it. And it may change. We're doing more meetings by Skype now, but never before we've sat down with someone and actually pressed flesh and met them. So that is key. So the key part about working in Gisborne is committing to regular flights. And by that we go, one, one of us travels at least once a month, or sometimes more regularly. And we just go and sit down, we'll have a project meeting, and then we come back with a laptop full of notes, and we do our work in Gizzy. Diversification, which means kind of trying new stuff. And so rather than just being a writing company, and we did used to just write, we, now, we then focused on the strategy. So helping, stepping back a bit and helping people plan, working out what they wanted us to write before we got into the writing. Social media, which is your Facebook, your Twitter, your blogs, all that kind of stuff, which we're doing a lot more of. And obviously mobile, so writing in a way which works well on, the, on your tiny screen on your phone. So all the same principles that worked for web in the past, which is short, sweet, concise, even more so is important these days because every website now is also being viewed on a bus on somebody's phone and it's a completely different, different world. Yes? So you, you know when you Yeah. Um, do you go back and say, okay, well, do these kids want you to go and yep. contact them? It's a really good question, and absolutely we do. Um, we, we do things like user surveys, which can be online or they can be just sat on paper. We, have, uh, we, we do things like user groups where people sit in a room and we, and we sort of canvas them about what their, their needs are. We use things like just general, um, an organization's general feedback through their call center. Um, which gives you a lot of information. You know, if they're getting 1,500 calls a week about, you know, where's our form for study link, that'll tell us that maybe that form needs to be on the home page. So things like that. So we're all def most definitely we're going out to the user, looking at what they're using. We also get to use this wonderful thing called um, Analytics, which is a, a Google service which tells you how people enter your site, their journey through the site, where they leave your site, where they, which can tell you where they're getting frustrated. It tells you high, high traffic areas of your site, which are therefore high priority content. So yeah, definitely, it's, all, it's, it's always going back to that user. It's, sometimes it's assumptions, just based on what you know, um, but wherever possible we're going to data, go looking at how people are using stuff and what they're asking for, and not necessarily just on the internet. It, it, often a company or organization's web 
is a way to get people out of their front desk or off the phone. So, that, so looking at how people are interacting with the company or organization offline is often as important as what they're doing online. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so that's since moving to Gizzy. We're coming to the end. Any questions? We just slow it down. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. How did you keep up to date with the generational speed that uh, goes on? Because, I mean, just being a parent, I noticed it's massive. Yeah. It's a huge, and I think it's a really good question, and I think we would normally play a pretty straight bat in terms of erring on the side of plain English in almost every case. When you write in a way, I think that is, um, and put it this, I think the easiest way to say it is that it's very, very rare that we have a job which requires us to write in a way that these guys would text each other. You know what I mean? Um, it does, that's not to say that there aren't sites that do that. I think that we normally would play, if we were writing a site that was at, aimed at sort of, you guys 11, 12, 13? Yeah. Something like that. We would probably write in a way that is a, a, essentially plain English, but then maybe with a flurry at the end. So it might be something which is like, to get your form about study link, go here, there, and the other thing, um, and, and then sign it off in a way that is maybe a little bit less um, formal. Do you know what I mean? But the whole thing isn't going to be written in a way we still need to get that information through in a way that's straight and clear. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is, is that the, creating that tone of the site, the design plays a large part in that. So you might have pictures of skateboarding and gamers and rock bands, and that tells the audience that this is a place for me, but the writing can be quite straight. So we're, we're sort of working fist in, fist in glove with the, with the designers in that way. Is that yeah. Um, looking ahead, and I think this is almost the last slide, we would love it if Gisborne builds a reputation as a tech hub so that people like you don't have to do what we did and go to Wellington for 12 years and do the corporate grind. We would love it if Gisborne had a reputation as a tech hub, that there were more companies like us based here, because there's absolutely no reason why there shouldn't be. This place has everything that you need to run a company like ours here. We want to be loud and proud about being based here, and I've got to say that currently we're not on our website. If you go there, you'll see that our postal address is still Wellington, and I would love to get away from that. And every, every few months, we, we ask ourselves, are we ready to put a Gisborne post box on there? And we haven't quite got there. We're probably closer to getting there than we ever have been. We're still worried that people won't ring us if they see that we're Gisborne based, because we, we worry about the perception out there. And call us silly, I don't know if we're silly, but we're still being a bit careful about it. But I would love to just have Gizzy all over our site. And if, if between the, myself and my partner, I'm always advocating, let's just go Gizzy, go Gizzy, go Gizzy. She's like, yeah. Um, but if the, if the perception out in the world was that Gisborne is a place where cool tech stuff happens, bring it on. We would love to, embrace, we, we'd love to help create that um, impression. And cheaper flights, because man, they are crippling. They cost us a bomb. Our, by far, our biggest cost is flying to, to visit clients. We don't have any office rent or anything like that. Um, I think that's it. Uh, I've just come to, thanks for coming, and any questions? Yeah. yeah. Do you have anything that is like your ice cream that you would love to get your hands on? Like a client that we'd love to do? Or business you'd love to just, and I wish you would just do this, because you can see the most potential of improvement. Is there anyone here from Ngati Puro? I'm, meet, I'm meeting them next week. I'd love to get that gig. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we, we, that's a really good question. Who would I really love to write for? That's a really good question. I, I can't actually say that. I feel like we've got a really nice... The thing I love about my job, and which I hated about my corporate job, is that we do... On any given day, I'm writing for an ice cream company, or a soft drink maker, or a government agency, or um, a, a Māori entity, or a school. We did diocesan school this year. Our, our, um, the range of what we do is so diverse and so broad, and that's what keeps... After 10 years, I'm still interested, because while we're doing essentially the same thing, we're doing it for completely different people, and working with completely different people in, in, in doing that. So there's huge diversity. So I don't think I've ever got to the point that we're going, gee, I'd really love to write their site. I'm sure there are sites like that. I'd love to write for Surfline. That's an American website which is all about surfing. I'd love to do that. Getting into more articles, getting back to my journalism roots, I think that would be something which really appeals. Yeah. Nah, did you miss the first part? 
Yeah, we've got nothing to do with design. It's, a, it's this thing, I'd, I'd say this to the UGU kids, is that the, the thing that I would really like to say that we represent, or I hope that we represent to you guys, is that you don't need to be techy to, to be involved in the tech industry. Don't ask me how to upgrade your Windows, or, or sync your iPhone, or fix your iPod. No idea. I am so deeply untechnical. My friend over here had to teach me how to sort out the PowerPoint today. I, I don't have a technical bone in my body. I had, to get, I had to get tuition to pass maths at school, but I always could just cruise through on the social sciences and the English. That was my, my buzz. I was always a good writer and a reader. It's what came naturally. And somehow, I found a way within this burgeoning industry, and all of you guys will be involved in it in some way, absolutely regardless, where I didn't need to be a mathematician or a designer or a techie guy or anything like that. There's a huge and a growing um, sector of the industry, which is people like you, or like me, who can communicate and, and um, talk in simple terms about technical issues, understand technical stuff, but relate it to clients in a way that's really straight. But no, we don't do the design. We partner with designers. Our, our model is to meet someone who, yeah, um, someone here presented from Provoke today. We, we work with Provoke in Wellington and, and a lot of big agencies in Wellington, and we like a bolt-on content team that comes in and works with the developers. Yeah, but no, don't, don't ask me to design a site, mate. I've got no interest and no ability. I'd much rather be outside. And Russell, we partner with Russell too. <laughs> we, love working, we love working local. We'd love there to be more Russells. We'd love there to be more pumping Gisborne companies that we work with so we didn't have to bloody fly everywhere to work with people. We would love that. Yeah, uh, we talk about it in our bios, I think. Yeah, I think we talk about it in our bios. We've, we've sort of slowly started to... Yeah, and, and more and more, and I've been wanting to blog about it for quite a while. I've been wanting to blog about the, um, that conundrum, you know, and to be open about it in that way and to, and to feed it in, because there's nothing I'd like more than to be a proudly Gisborne company, but I do... We have a hunch that people... The perception of us being in Wellington is a kind of a marketing thing, and I really wish we didn't have to do that. There's a, there's a sort of a fakeness about that that I hate, but it's just biz, it's business. So, And then as the, the, the irony is, is that as soon as you're on the phone to someone, it's the first thing we talk about. Can, you, can we meet tomorrow? Oh, we live in Gisborne. Oh, can we meet on Friday? Sure. And no one has ever had a problem with it, but it's just that first call. Once the first call, they hear that you're a good person, they hear that you're onto it, and then you talk about Gizzy, and then it sounds okay. But we just don't want to be put off by the first impression. Yeah, people are really open to it. Um, any other questions? Anything you want to tell me? No? No worries. Thanks everyone, thanks for coming.